A young woman, a secret affair, and a love so intoxicating that it led to a courtroom spectacle that held the city spellbound. One of the most renowned cases in Scottish legal history is that of Madeline Smith, a Victorian-era Glasgow socialite whose life took a chilling turn when she became the accused in a sensational murder trial that shook Scotland in 1857, so much so that Smith's tumultuous tale became the gripping foundation for numerous theatrical productions. However it was the renowned David Lean who masterfully brought her narrative to life in the cinematic masterpiece, Madeline. Born on March 29, 1835, Madeline Smith, the eldest of five siblings, hails from an affluent family in Glasgow. Her father James Smith was a prosperous architect, while her mother Elizabeth was the daughter of the renowned neoclassical architect David Hamilton. Madeline's early life was rooted in privilege, she was born at the family residence at 81 Wellington Place in Glasgow. In 1855, the family relocated from India Street to 7 Blythswood Square, Glasgow, settling in the lower section of a house owned by her maternal uncle David Hamilton, who was a yarn merchant. Situated atop Blythswood Hill, this house was part of a significant development overseen by William Harley, a Scottish textile manufacturer and entrepreneur, known for his early contributions to the city of Glasgow, including the development of the new town of Blythswood, covering Blythswood Hill. Additionally, they possessed a country estate named Rowlin near Helensborough. Madeline embodied the epitome of an upper-class young woman, ticking all the boxes of societal expectations. Described as popular, affectionate, vivacious, and intelligent, she seamlessly fit the mold of a well-bred young lady. Her life, for the most part, unfolded without notable incidents, except for a brief hiatus when she was sent to Miss Gorton's London finishing school at the age of 14. This interval in the bustling capital seemingly added a touch of sophistication to her upbringing. After a few years, Madeline returned to her Scottish roots, likely carrying with her the refined qualities instilled by her finishing school experience. Defying the stringent Victorian norms of the era, Madeline embarked on a clandestine romance in the spring of 1855 with Pierre-Emile Langelier, a nurseryman apprentice hailing from the Channel Islands. Despite being nearly a decade her senior and from a markedly different social background, Emile captivated Madeline's affections. At the outset of their relationship, Madeline was a youthful 20 years old, while Emile stood at 29. Emile's upbringing contrasted sharply with Madeline's privileged lifestyle. Raised by a family sustaining a modest seed business, he learned the ropes as a teenager at a local nursery, where he mastered the English language. Following an offer of employment on an estate near Edinburgh, Emile's fortunes took a downturn upon his employer's passing, leaving him adrift and allegedly forced to toil on various estates until eventually settling in Glasgow in 1852. This unlikely union between Madeline and Emile defied social expectations and set the stage for a tumultuous and tragic love story. Despite the glaring disparity in their social statuses, Emile, now working as a packing clerk, and Madeline continued to nurture their improbable romance, which blossomed into a clandestine love affair. Given the clandestine nature of their affair, their relationship thrived in the shadows, and letters served as their primary mode of communication. Madeline, a prolific letter writer, penned her first letter to Emile in April 1855. A veritable virtuoso of the written word, she poured her heart out in countless missives, sometimes composing up to twenty letters a day. Her dedication to maintaining their connection was evident in her frequent visits to the post office in Glasgow's George Square, where she diligently sent and retrieved their secret correspondence. Remarkably, the efficiency of the postal service often ensured that responses from Emile arrived within a matter of hours, further fueling the flames of their forbidden love. She folded and refolded her letters meticulously, sometimes composing multiple missives within a brief span, which were then sent together in a single envelope. The letters not only delved into details about her family and social engagements, but also vividly expressed her passionate intimacy with Emile, their aspirations for the future, and their late-night rendezvous at Madeline's bedroom window, marking the unconventional nature of their relationship. 
Mindful of the secrecy shrouding their relationship, Madeline meticulously ensured the privacy of their affair by burning all the letters sent by her clandestine lover. As their forbidden love deepened, Madeline and Emile found themselves on the cusp of what seemed to be an imminent engagement, a prospect they concealed from Madeline's unsuspecting parents. With plans for a wedding in September of 1856 quietly in the works, Emile spared no effort in his bid to win the approval of Madeline's family. Despite being offered a lucrative position in Lima, Peru, as part of their future plans, Madeline intervened, expressing her heartfelt reluctance for Emile to pursue this distant opportunity. In a poignant letter to Emile, she insisted that he abandon the idea of relocating to Lima, emphasizing her unwavering commitment to their relationship and her desire for them to remain together in Europe. In a letter, she stated, My dearest Emile, I hope you have given up on the idea of going to Lima. I will never be allowed to go to Lima with you, so I suppose you want to get rid of your Mimi. You can get plenty of appointments in Europe, any place in Europe. For my sake, do not go. September came and went with no wedding taking place, as a new obstacle to the union appeared in the form of a wealthy merchant named William Harper Minnick. Introduced to the Smith family by James Smith himself during a business trip, 30-year-old William quickly gained favor as a potential suitor for Madeline. Oblivious to Madeline's clandestine affair with Emile, her parents enthusiastically welcomed William into their home, eventually arranging for him to reside in a flat above theirs. Unbeknownst to the Smiths, their efforts to secure a suitable match for Madeline within the upper middle class of Glasgow had unwittingly set the stage for a conflict of hearts, as William Harper Minnick emerged as Madeline's intended fiancé, casting a shadow over her forbidden romance with Emile. As time passed, Madeline's initial inclination towards the man chosen by her father, evolved into genuine affection, a sentiment she openly conveyed to Emile through their extensive correspondence. Initially, Madeline's candid discussions about her interactions with William may have seemed innocuous, particularly when she harbored little fondness for him, however as her feelings for William blossomed, Madeline's transparency inadvertently exacerbated Emile's jealousy and heartache. Despite her deepening attachment to William, Madeline found herself caught in a poignant dilemma, torn between her familial obligations and her clandestine love for Emile. The pivotal moment arrived in February of 1857, when Madeline accepted William's marriage proposal, recognizing the stark reality that her family would never accept Emile as her husband. Faced with societal expectations and the allure of a promising match, Madeline made the agonizing decision to sever ties with Emile, effectively bringing their clandestine romance to an end. Despite her earlier transparency about her interactions with William, Madeline found herself unable to confront enraged Emile about her engagement. Instead, she opted to terminate their relationship, symbolically returning one of her letters to him. In her letter, Madeline expressed surprise at having her previous correspondence rebuffed, viewing it as a sign that their communication should cease. She quoted, I felt truly astonished to have my last letter returned to me, but it will be the last time you have the opportunity to return to me. When you are not pleased with the letters I send you, then our correspondence shall be at an end, and as there is coolness on both sides, our engagement had better be broken. Altogether, I think owing to coolness and indifference, nothing else, that we had better, for the future, consider ourselves strangers. I trust your honor as a gentleman that you will not reveal anything that may have passed between us. She went on to state that despite loving him once, her love had now ceased and suggested that their engagement be dissolved due to perceived mutual coolness and indifference, urging Emile to preserve their past by maintaining their privacy, however rather than respecting her wishes, Emile responded with threats, vowing to expose their correspondence to Madeline's parents and even to the public if she refused to comply with their mutual promises of marriage. Fearing the catastrophic repercussions of such actions, which could result in her being ostracized from her family, Madeline appealed to her former lover not to follow through on his threats. She emphasized the grave consequences it would have on her future and her relationship with her family, highlighting the immense pressure she was under to conform to societal expectations. 
The weeks following were fraught with desperate attempts by Madeline to persuade Emil to relinquish the letters, with purported secret meetings and an escalating urgency to conceal her clandestine affair. During this time, despite rumors circulating about Madeline's engagement with William, she denied their veracity to Emil. This tense exchange abruptly came to a tragic halt on March 23, 1857, when Emil passed away suddenly, sparking a flurry of local gossip and speculation. In the aftermath of the shocking events, the dawn of March 26 brought with it the unsettling discovery of Madeline's absence from the Smith family home. It wasn't long before William, accompanied by one of her brothers, reportedly tracked her down aboard a steamboat along the River Clyde, near Helensburgh. Here, amidst the serene backdrop of the family's country property known as Rowlin, Madeline was confronted about her sudden departure. Stricken with shame and consumed by fear of her parents' disapproval, she confessed, revealing the depths of her desperation and the unraveling of her meticulously guarded secrets. After a brief interlude at Rowlin, the trio retraced their steps back to the streets of Glasgow, however their return was met with a chilling revelation as the police uncovered stacks of letters penned by Madeline in Emile's room and office. These damning missives, coupled with the findings of an initial autopsy, cast a dark shadow over Madeline's previously pristine socialite status. With mounting evidence against her, including the discovery of a collection of Madeline's love letters in Emile's room, the wheels of justice turned swiftly, culminating in her arrest on March 31st on charges of murder. The exact number of letters she wrote to him remains unknown, but nearly 200 were discovered in his lodgings and office desk. Many of these letters lacked dates or were only dated by the day of the week. Her handwriting proved challenging to decipher, and frequently upon completing a page, she would rotate the paper and overwrite her previous text rather than using a fresh sheet. The trial of Smith attracted significant public attention, prompting its transfer to Edinburgh, where proceedings commenced on June 30, 1857. Despite the prosecution's attempts to present Smith's letters as evidence, Emile's private diary detailing their meetings was deemed inadmissible. While the letters hinted at a possible motive for the murder, it was the evidence of Smith's purchase of arsenic on multiple occasions leading up to Emile's demise that ultimately swayed the prosecution, cementing their case against her. The trial took place at the High Court in Edinburgh on a wet and dismal Tuesday, and as a throng of onlookers gathered outside hoping to catch a glimpse of her, only a select few were granted access to the courtroom. According to contemporary accounts, Madeline Smith made her entrance, clad in a brown silk dress and a black silk cloak. Witnesses described her step as buoyant, her eyes bright, as if she were entering a theater box for an opera performance. In her hands, she carried a white cambric handkerchief and a silver-topped smelling bottle, though she never found occasion to use them throughout the proceedings. Despite the gravity of the situation, Madeline maintained a composed and dignified presence, leaving an impression on all who beheld her entrance. During the trial, Smith received legal representation from advocate John Inglis, who had also presided over the case of the poisoner Edward William Pritchard, the last person to be publicly hanged in Glasgow in 1865. Investigation into her case concluded that she was also seen at a drugstore, where she ordered arsenic under the alias M. H. Smith. In her defense, two druggists testified during the trial, emphasizing that they intentionally colored their arsenic to prevent accidents, an aspect not detected in the autopsy. Additionally, Emile's valet testified that he had contemplated self-harm on at least one occasion, casting a strong suggestion of self-harm in the case. Several factors contributed to the sensational nature of the trial, akin to a Shakespearean drama, enhancing its intrigue, however the primary reason for the sensation was the tone and content of the letters presented as evidence during the trial. These letters, likely containing compelling or scandalous content, were read out loud by the court clerk, consuming almost the entire fifth day of the trial on July 4, 1857. 
due to their frank expressions of desire and affection, revealing the young woman's sexual appetite, acknowledgement of losing her virginity to Emil, and reference to herself as his wife, they shocked and excited Victorian society. The letters were also widely published in the newspapers of the time. A prison matron reported that Smith received hundreds of letters from admirers offering consolation, money, and marriage proposals during the proceedings. Despite the drama surrounding the trial, and evidence seemingly pointing towards Smith's guilt, the jury ultimately returned a verdict of not guilty on the first count, and a not proven verdict on the second count, a uniquely Scottish verdict indicating that the prosecution failed to present a convincing enough case to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Essentially, it leaves the question of guilt or innocence unresolved, and Madeline was released because it could be demonstrated that she had purchased arsenic, however it could not be proved that she had been with the victim on the night he died. Another theory was put forward that a heartbroken Emil had perhaps administered the arsenic on himself in despair, when he realized Madeline was likely to leave him. The case's pivotal aspect revolved around the chronology of certain letters from Madeline to Emil, with the undated letters relying on the interpretation of the envelopes. One specific letter hinged on the accurate interpretation of the postmark date, unfortunately rendered illegible, drawing caustic comments from the judge, however the majority of these postmarks were evidently clear. It was revealed that when the police searched Emile's room, many of Madeline's letters were discovered without their envelopes, hastily gathered and inserted into whatever envelopes were available. Authorities later uncovered crucial evidence suggesting foul play in Emile's sudden illness and subsequent death. Smith attempted to poison Emile on three distinct occasions, with the final attempt proving fatal. On Saturday, February 21, Smith purchased a small quantity of arsenic from a local apothecary, seemingly for use in rat control, as documented in the poison book. The following day, February 22, after a night out, Emil experienced a severe bout of stomach pain, rendering him bedridden for over a week. Undeterred by this initial setback, Madeline proceeded to purchase additional arsenic from the apothecary on March 6, and again on March 17. Suspiciously, on March 19, Emil left town but unexpectedly returned on the 22nd, claiming to his landlady that he had received a letter summoning him back. He requested a key to the front door from his landlady, citing anticipated lateness upon his return, however upon his arrival, Emile fell gravely ill from arsenic poisoning, further implicating Madeline in a web of deceit and treachery. Found in critical pain in his accommodation by his landlady, she summoned the doctor at 5 a.m., however just six hours later, Emile was dead. Inside his vest pocket was a letter from Madeline, asking him to meet with her secretly, in Emile's diary, he meticulously documented how he had started experiencing unusual symptoms after visiting Madeline in Glasgow. Sharing his suspicions of being poisoned with several friends, Emile confided in his landlady, expressing his perplexity at his sudden illness, particularly after consuming coffee from Madeline. In a startling admission, he remarked, I can't think why I was so unwell after getting that coffee from her. If she were to poison me, I would forgive her. Madeline walked free from court and started a life in Bridge of Allen, located in central Scotland, leaving behind their Glasgow residence. Later in 1860, the family relocated once again to Old Polmont. The burden of the entire affair took a toll, leading to her father's demise in Polmont in 1863. After her tumultuous past, Madeline eventually found stability and happiness in her personal life as she married business manager George Wardle on July 4, 1861, and together they had two children named Thomas and Mary. During this phase of her life, Madeline became actively engaged with the Fabian Society in London, where she wholeheartedly embraced her role as an organizer. Under her new married name, not everyone recognized her true identity, and despite the veil of anonymity she enjoyed, Madeline's dedication and enthusiasm for her work within the Fabian Society left an indelible mark. While her true identity remained hidden from many, her contributions to society's endeavors were impactful, according to those who crossed paths with her. 
Later in life in her late 50s, she made a significant move to New York in 1889, after Madeline and George Wardle separated despite years of their happy marriage. Around 1916, she entered into a second marriage with William A. Sheehy, which endured until his passing in 1926, and Madeline died in New York two years later, at the age of 93, leaving behind a legacy of resilience and perseverance. The case of Madeline Smith has captivated scholars and amateur criminologists for decades. While the details of the case have been scrutinized extensively, most modern scholars tend to believe that Madeline was indeed responsible for the crime, however what prevented her from receiving a guilty verdict and facing a potential death sentence was the lack of concrete evidence proving that Madeline and Emile had met in the weeks leading up to his death. This absence of direct eyewitness testimony linking Madeline to Emile during the critical time frame proved to be a significant factor in the trial's outcome. Following the trial, a small article appeared in The Scotsman, indicating that a witness had come forward claiming to have seen a young male and female outside Madeline's house on the night of Emile's death. This potentially crucial testimony could have provided vital insight into the events surrounding the crime, however due to the timing of the trial, the witness was unable to be questioned during the proceedings, leaving this piece of evidence unresolved and unable to be properly addressed in court. Madeline Smith's story has inspired numerous dramatic works and adaptations, including the 1950 film Madeline, and the 1958 television play, Killer in Close-Up, The Trial of Madeline Smith. Wilkie Collins drew inspiration from this case for his 1875 novel, The Law and the Lady. The play, Dishonored Lady, and its film adaptations in 1932 and 1947 also took inspiration from Smith's story. Additionally, the case was dramatized in a 1952 radio episode of the Black Museum. Several novels, including The House in Queen and Square, and Lovers All Untrue, explored the case, and Madeline Smith was a fixture in the Chamber of Horrors section of the Edinburgh Wax Museum from 1976 to 1989. To this day, there remains a divergence of opinions on whether she was framed or successfully got away with the murder. The enduring fascination with Madeline's story speaks to its timeless allure and complexity. From the dramatic retellings in film, television, and literature to the ongoing debates among scholars and enthusiasts, her tale continues to captivate audiences worldwide. Whether viewed as a tragic heroine, a femme fatale, or something in between, Madeline Smith's legacy endures as a testament to the enduring power of human drama and the enduring allure of the unknown. In the words of a Scotsman report from the time, she would be known as either the most fortunate of criminals, or the most unfortunate of women.